Tonight, I'm gonna to show you how to design furniture like an engineer. As many of you may have already realized, I am an engineer by day and a woodworker by night. Sometimes it's hard to turn off the engineering brain when I come home, but when it comes to designing furniture and doing woodworking, having an engineering mindset can give you a huge advantage and can make your furniture last for years and years to come. So tonight I'm gonna to walk you through the engineering design process and what I go through to build furniture. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you a couple tips of engineering principles that you can use in your designs when you're designing furniture. If you search for engineering design process, you'll find all kinds of graphics and lists and things that show some variation of these steps. So let's get into it. The first step in any design process is to define the requirements. Now when this comes to furniture, this means what are the things that you need to have in your furniture? Is there a certain dimension you need? Is there a height? Do you need a certain number of drawers? Are you looking for it to fit a sink? Are you looking for a certain kind of wood? A certain color? Is there a certain design style you're going for? Do you have a customer? Maybe it's your spouse that wants you to do this project. Maybe it's a project your spouse has been wanting you to do for a couple years now. Not that I have any experience in that. So I either take a piece of paper and write down these requirements or I just list them out in my head and I try to make sure that that I capture everything that is important in this build. When I build things for my kids, sometimes I'll even bring them into the process. When I started building my indoor treehouse, I sat down with my kids and I said, what sort of things would you want on this? What would make it fun to play on? Once you have all your design requirements laid out, then you go to the next phase, which is research. And this is when you do internet searches, you do picture searches, you look at books, you look at ideas, you look at magazines, whatever you need to do to get those creative juices flowing and see kind of what's out there. I like to do this to see what I can improve on. So I'll do all kinds of image searches on tables or bunk beds or nightstands or chairs or whatever it is I'm building. I try to figure out what has been done what is the norm, what's accepted. Once I find something that I like, I will usually take a screenshot and save that into a folder. Now, it may not be the entire piece of furniture that I like, but I might say, I like how they did the trim on the edge of that, or I like the handrail on this. And so all those things get put into a folder. It's not necessarily that I like the whole piece, and it's not that I'm gonna duplicate that piece, but there's one aspect of it that I like and I wanna use. Once you've decided that you have scoured the interwebs of the world, or you have all the ideas that you think you need, the next phase we enter is brainstorming and sketching. Now, if you like to do stuff in 3D models, that's great, you can do that too. Sometimes I like to design stuff in 3D models. Usually I start out just on a piece of paper with a pencil. This gives me the freedom to be able to get something down quickly, to capture ideas. It makes it so that I don't get too involved in the process. Sometimes when I'm 3D modeling something, I can get too involved in trying to figure out how to model it exactly how I want it, and then I miss the creative just brain dump of putting stuff down on paper. So get a notebook, get some graph paper, draw stuff out, sketch it out, and then you can run it by your customer, your spouse, your kids, whoever, and just see kind of what things they like. Or if you're just designing it for yourself, see what you like. Sketch out ideas and the things that are important to you. I like to get an overall view of the whole thing so I can get the proportions right. When I built my big bookshelf in my living room, I needed to make sure that it looked good proportionally as well as visually up close. The idea of this is to just get everything out, all of those ideas, get them out on paper. Once you finish the brainstorming and you feel like you have a good idea, then you go to the planning and the design phase. In this phase, you're down selecting. You're selecting the design that you want to end up with. This is when you're going to take a lot of the ideas that you brainstormed and incorporate them into your design. As you down select and get to kind of a final design, you also want to look at a little bit more of the specifics of the design. This is when I'll usually think about things like what type of joinery I want to use. I'll look at how the corners are coming together. I'll look at how I'm attaching a tabletop on. And this is when I'll also start sketching the details. So I'll do a detailed view of a corner joint or I'll do a detailed view of a stack up of a couple different boards. Again, you can do this on paper by hand, or at this point, this would be a good time to go to your computer and start doing the 3D modeling if you're comfortable with that. You can use SketchUp, Fusion 360, whatever modeling software you want and you're comfortable with. Start modeling it and thinking about more of the details. You don't have to finalize all of the details. I found that I like to get to a certain point where I feel like I've got a good handle on the design and then I'll step back and start building and work out some of those final details as I'm building it. This plan phase also will include things like figuring out your materials list, figuring out how much lumber you need. You're really trying to narrow down the design and get everything lined up so you can start building. Now we get to the point where you can start making sawdust, the build and the prototype phase. 
This phase is the one that most people are familiar with because most of us build stuff. If you're doing something that you have a pretty solid design and it's pretty straightforward, you have the dimensions right, the proportions right, maybe you don't need to worry about doing a prototype. But if you have something that you're trying to either make comfortable or something mechanical or something maybe structurally a bit challenging, then you're probably gonna wanna make a prototype. A lot of people will do prototypes for chairs to make sure they have the angle right, make sure it's comfortable. You don't wanna get through the final build using all of your hardwood and realize this is not very comfortable. You also don't wanna have to remake something because the dimensions or the proportions were wrong. I've had times where I've made a prototype out of cardboard boxes so I can see visually what something's going to look like in the space. Often I will jump right into the build on the project and not do a prototype because either I built something similar or it's just not required because it's not that complex. That's perfectly fine too. If you are prototyping though, this is the time when you would do some testing. If you're doing a chair, this is when you're going to sit down and try it out and see if it works. If you need to change that design, then now's the time to do it in the prototype phase before you get to the final build. When I build projects, I usually try to start with the structural pieces first. I rough cut all of the corner posts or the shelves, things that are gonna hold the piece up. I also like to work bottom to top when I'm building something like a cabinet or a bookcase or something. Finally, the last phase is improve your design. Now, this may not happen on each project, but you can see this improvement happen as you progress and as you build new projects, you should see growth, you should see improvement on that. And you can say, hey, I did this on my other design of this piece of furniture and it's not my favorite, it still works, but I wanna do it a little bit differently, I wanna improve that. So then the next time you build something similar, you can say, ah, I remember what I learned on that project, now I'm gonna incorporate that on my new design. That improvement process is what happens slowly over time, so you improve your design then you start defining new requirements for your next piece of furniture and the whole cycle starts over again. That is the engineering design process that I use when I build furniture. Many of you probably already do something similar to this if you've designed furniture before, but it's nice to see the whole process all laid out. Now for the engineering principles and tips that I learned in engineering school. The first thing I want to talk about is load path. In structural engineering, a load is like a weight. So the load path is how that weight is carried through whatever your structure is. In the instance of, let's say, a table. The load path means that whatever is on the surface of the table, all the weight on the table is gonna be transferred through your legs coming down. If they're straight legs, it'll go straight down to the floor through that. That's a very solid load path. Let's say you have a complex base that has some diagonals and some other angles in it. Then it will have to transfer through all those members down to the floor where it's supporting the weight. In the case of a cabinet, the load path is typically the sides of the cabinet. So whatever weight you have on your countertop will be transferred down through the sides of the cabinet down to the floor. To build solid furniture, you need to make sure your load path is very defined, that you know exactly where that is and that it's strong enough to handle the load. Now this doesn't mean you can't make furniture that's crazy or abstract or you know counterbalanced or cantilevered out. Um, you can do all of that, but you just need to make sure that your load path can support the weight. Think of the classic example of the bodybuilder that only works out his upper body. He's gonna be huge on top, but then get these skinny little legs down below and won't be able to support all the weight from up above. On all of my furniture designs, I always am thinking about the load path of how do I get the weight from up above down to the floor and get it transferred through my structure. If your load path is weak and poorly defined, your furniture will be weak. The next engineering principle that I wanna talk about is shelf capacity. Now we have all seen what happens when you have too much weight on a particle board shelf and the shelf starts to go like this. That bow in the middle should not be there if you've done the analysis correctly. In my statics and dynamics classes, we learned how to do calculations to figure out if you have a distributed load across a cantilevered beam or a beam supported on either end. What's Lucky for you, you don't have to do any of those calculations because there is an awesome website that has already figured out all of those for you. This website is a calculator that calculates SAG, also known as the SAGulator. So if you go to this website, you enter in the type of wood that you have, you enter in the width of your shelf or whatever it is that you're measuring, the thickness and the span. So with all those numbers, they can calculate the deflection that's gonna happen in that shelf or the sag. There's a built-in number that they say anything less than this is acceptable deflection. You can deflect on a large shelf, sometimes up to even a 16th of an inch, and your eye probably won't pick up on that. 
However, if you stick with the maximum deflection that they give you on this website, you shouldn't have an issue. In furniture building, there are shelves everywhere. It's not always considered a shelf. Sometimes it's a drawer bottom. Sometimes it's a tabletop. There's lots of different things that act like a shelf that you can use the sagulator to calculate. The next engineering principle that I want to talk about is edge margin. Now the edge margin is basically the distance from a hole that you drill to the edge of a board. This is really important when you have something that is structurally going to be moving in this hole. If it's going to be rotating or if there's going to be a lot of weight supported in this hole, you want to make sure that you have enough edge margin that it's not going to tear out and it's not going to crack. This is true when you're drilling a hole perpendicular to the face of the board. This is also true when you're drilling into the end of a board. We've all seen situations where somebody drilled a hole too close to the top of the board and put a screw in or something and it split out. Maybe that was something you made. The rule of thumb we like to use in most engineering designs is two and a half D. This means that you take the diameter of the hole that you drilled and you go from the center of that hole two and a half times out to the edge of your board. Now there are cases when it can be less than that, but keep in mind if you're putting a lot of weight on this or if it's holding structure, then you're gonna to wanna to have at least two and a half D. The last principle I wanna talk about is safety factor. Now safety factors are designed into everything. You may not realize this, but anytime something says max capacity 500 pounds, for example, that does not mean that if you put 501 pounds, it will fail catastrophically. It means there's a safety factor built in. I like to use a safety factor of two, sometimes three if I'm really concerned. That means if the posted sign says 500 pound capacity, it can probably handle up to a thousand before it fails. Good design should always have safety factors. When I built that indoor treehouse in my basement as well, I had to figure out how to build a bridge to support the weight of kids running across it. Now, I didn't want to be able to just support kids. I wanted to be able to support adults. So in that design, I used thicker cables that could handle up to 800 pounds on each cable. I also doubled up my cable clamps at the end to make some redundancy. So I looped the cable through one cable clamp and then came out again and put another cable clamp. That way I have a safety factor in there or redundancy so that if one thing fails, the whole thing will not fail. I did this also in my bunk bed designs where I know that the worst thing that could happen on a bunk bed is that the top bunk falls down, hits the bottom bunk. So I have structural fasteners that are going into the corners of the bed. I also have blocks underneath those corners that are screwed into the side with structural fasteners. Just for good measure, I also glued those blocks in place just to make sure that I had another backup. It's not as hard as you may think to design furniture. And for me, that's half the fun of doing woodworking. You can make your own custom pieces of furniture that you can show off to your friends and your neighbors. Anytime you can build something that is exactly what you want, exactly the dimensions, the size, the color, the wood, everything, it feels so satisfying and it feels like this was made for you. There are so many engineering principles that apply to woodworking, I may have to do another video with the next set. And like I said before, as long as you're trying to improve on every project, then you're doing great. Now you know engineering isn't just for nerds. Now go build something and we'll see you next time. Now, where's my pocket protector? <laughs>